Hot Jupiters were a pretty big surprise when we first discovered them. As the first exoplanets were being found, we assumed most planetary systems would probably be similar to our own, with the giant planets in the outer system. This also makes sense when you consider how planets form. When a system is forming, the icy material coalesces in the outer parts of the system where it's cold enough. This includes a lot of hydrogen, which is the main thing gas giants are made of. But then we found Domitium, a planet half the size of Jupiter taking just four days to orbit its star Helvidios. Thirty years later, we know of a ton of hot Jupiters like it, including planets you've probably heard of, like HD 189733b or Trace 2b. Despite how it may seem, hot Jupiters are pretty rare. It's expected that only about 1% of stars similar to the Sun will have one, and that number decreases with both the age of the star as well as the size of the star, with red dwarfs having them even less. We know of so many because they're easy to see. The two best methods of exoplanet detection, transit and radial velocity, both of which have been used to confirm thousands of exoplanets each, work better with large planets closer to their stars, which is exactly what hot Jupiters are. So despite knowing of so many of them, they aren't actually common. We know of so many because of observation bias. But anyways, a lot of questions about how they even come to exist are still unanswered. There are two main ways we expect a hot Jupiter to be able to form. It either somehow forms near its current orbit very close to the star, or it forms in the outer system and migrates to its current position. But the planet will look different depending on which of these two scenarios resulted in its formation. If it formed in the outer system, for example, it would have a very different composition made of more volatiles than a planet that formed in the inner system. So to know how a hot Jupiter formed, we first have to know what's in its atmosphere. And for a select few hot Jupiters, we know enough to make pretty good guesses as to how they formed. And one such planet is Tylos. Tylos, also called WASP-121b before being given an official name in 2022, is a large hot gas giant about 858 light years away, orbiting the F-type star Dilmun. It's one of the most well-studied hot Jupiters we know of. It was the first planet outside the solar system found to contain water vapor, and the first known to possess a stratosphere. It's tidally locked to Dilma with a daytime temperature of over 4,200 degrees Fahrenheit, or 2,300 Celsius, and takes slightly more than one day to orbit it. Temperatures on the night side are over 1,000 degrees colder at 2,240 degrees Fahrenheit, or 1,226 Celsius. The night side has condensation made of titanium dioxide, the relatively cooler temperatures trapping it there and preventing it from being found on the day side. Silicon dioxide, methane, and carbon monoxide have also been found, indicating that the atmosphere has some very complex chemical reactions going on. Data from the Spitzer Space Telescope is even consistent with a gas torus surrounding the planet, which, though speculative right now, could indicate the presence of a volcanically active moon similar to Io. I talked about a similar case in my video about WASP-49b. Tylos is about 10% more massive than Jupiter, but is 75% larger in radius, because the high temperatures cause its atmosphere to puff out and expand. We know enough about its atmosphere to make detailed simulations of its weather patterns, which can be seen here. All in all, we know a lot about this planet. But like most hot Jupiters, one of the things we didn't know for a while was how it formed. And a new paper came out recently that not only gives us an even better understanding of the structure of the Tylosian atmosphere, but also provides a good explanation for its formation. It's expected that Tylos formed in the outer system, a place where icy material could accumulate, and then spiraled inward, accreting rocky planetesimals in the inner system that were forming at the time, and then settled into its present day orbit. There are a few other papers also proposing similar things, and I'll link them in the description as well. It's somewhat expected that many hot Jupiters formed in this way, but Tylos is one of the few with actual real evidence that it used to be in the outer system before becoming a hot Jupiter. A lot of evidence for this comes in Tylos' carbon to oxygen ratio. Dilmun is largely depleted of carbon, and has a much higher ratio of oxygen. But Tylos, on the other hand, has a much higher ratio of carbon in comparison to its star. This suggests that Tylos must have formed in a place where chemicals containing carbon, such as the methane found in Tylos' atmosphere today, existed in a gaseous form, which would explain the overabundance of carbon. However, that would not explain the lack of oxygen. For the little amount of oxygen, the opposite is true, and Tylos must have formed in an area cold enough for chemicals containing oxygen, such as water, to be solid. In other words, Tylos must have formed beyond the snow line, the area around a star where it's cold enough for icy particles to condense. In the solar system, the snow line is around the distance Jupiter is from the Sun, and for the WASP-121 system, where the star is bigger than the Sun, it must be even further away. However, there are multiple snow lines in every system, and different compounds have different distances where they condense into solid particles. 
All in all, Tylos must have formed beyond the water snow line, but closer to Dilmun than the carbon monoxide snow line. If Tylos had formed around the sun, that would correspond to a distance between Jupiter and Uranus. So based on everything we know about the composition of Tylos, we know that it must have formed in the outer reaches of its system, somewhat equivalent to where the solar system's outer planets are today. So how did it get to its present day orbit? For comparison, Tylos likely formed over 1,000 times further away from Dilmun than it is today. On its current orbit, it's only separated from the star by 0.02 AU, 50 times closer to it than Earth orbits the Sun. And what happened to the rest of the system? When planets spiral inward like this, they have the tendency to mess everything up. Could there have been a scenario where Tylos barreled through the inner Wasp-121 system and destroyed any planets that formed there? These questions can be answered by looking again at Tylos' composition, but this time focusing on refractory elements like iron and nickel. These elements are more common the closer you get to the star. By finding out the abundances of these chemicals, it's possible to determine not only some possible paths Tylos may have taken as it moved closer to the star, but even what types of objects it disturbed as it came through. First off, it's important to note that today, Tylos is on a polar orbit around its star, perpendicular to its equator. This is rare among planets, though seems to be more common than you'd think for hot Jupiters. Planets usually form along their star's equators, so for Tylos to get here, it's possible that it may have been scattered onto this orbit by unseen planets, though that's unconfirmed. Observations of Tylos have shown that these refractory elements, like iron and nickel, are underabundant, which could indicate a few things. One being that Tylos was put onto a polar orbit early on, which could mean that as it spiraled inward, it didn't pass through the protoplanetary disk much, leading to less accumulation of rocky material. Or these elements could be hidden by being found lower in the atmosphere, which would make observing them difficult. Evidence of the second scenario is seen in Tylos' lack of titanium, which indicates that all of the titanium is cold trapped in the lower atmosphere. However, some heavier chemicals were detected, such as silicon monoxide. Because Tylos is so hot, most materials that we know as rocks on Earth are gases in Tylos' atmosphere, including chemicals like silicon monoxide and quartz. It suggested that these chemicals became present in Tylos after its atmosphere formed, and that it was accumulated through asteroids and planetesimals, not dust particles. This could indicate that Tylos migrated to its current position relatively late in planet formation, as it was mostly done forming by this time, and the inner system was full of rocky planetesimals instead of just dust. So while there are still a lot of unknowns, the history of Tylos is becoming clearer. This planet definitely did not form where it is today, and likely formed in the outer system, before somehow finding itself on a polar orbit and spiraling inwards, where it eventually reached the inner system, absorbed some rocky material, and settled into its present day orbit. However, there are still some unanswered questions about Tylos' present day environment. We actually don't expect to see methane on Tylos at all. It was a surprise to find out it was there. This is because in the insane Tylosian dayside heat, methane is unstable. Tylos is likely about a billion years old, so by this time, there shouldn't be any methane left. Yet methane exists on the night side and in pretty high amounts, which suggests that it must be somehow replenished. This brings me to the second thing the recent paper talked about beyond Tylos' formation, the structure of its atmosphere. Essentially, the first ever 3D structure of Tylos' atmosphere is made, suggesting that it's split into at least three layers. The top layer contains mostly hydrogen, the middle is where the sodium is, and the lower layer is where the iron is. They also suggest that Tylos has a jet stream containing sodium that moves material across the equatorial regions, and the layer below it moves the gas from the day side to the night side. At lower latitudes, closer to Tylos' polar regions, titanium was detected. Not only have we detected what chemicals are in Tylos' atmosphere, we've even detected what parts of the planet they're found in. But this still doesn't explain the methane. To account for the presence of methane, Tylos must have vertical currents. Essentially, wind currents from the lower atmosphere move methane into the higher parts of the night side, where it becomes detectable. In this scenario, the lower layers of the atmosphere are rich in methane because of Tylos' high carbon to oxygen ratio, and the relatively lower temperatures of the night side. This explains why methane doesn't exist on the day side, but is much more common on the night side. This vertical mixing isn't usually seen in dynamical models of exoplanets, but it's probably the best explanation for what we're seeing on Tylos. In short, Tylos is one of the most interesting and well-studied exoplanets we've ever found. We've been able to discover a lot about its atmosphere, which seems to be extremely complicated, with jet streams, several layers with different compositions, vertical mixing, massive variations between the day and night side, and a lot more. 
but the composition of the atmosphere also indicates that Tylus didn't form as a hot Jupiter, and may have began life similar to the giant planets of the solar system. But instead of staying pretty much where it formed, for some reason, Tylus spiraled in toward the star, potentially after being scattered onto a polar orbit, accreting some rocky material and eventually settling into its present day orbit. Tylus' history is chaotic, and it may be representative of a lot of other hot Jupiters we know less about. Maybe something similar happened with dozens of other planets we know of. Another big unanswered question about this is how the migration of a hot Jupiter could affect the formation of the rest of the system, and I'll talk about that in my upcoming video about Kepler-725, which is a system with a hot Jupiter and a regular planet beyond it. But even though we know a lot about Tylos, there are still a lot of unanswered questions about it, and even more about the other planets similar to it. Hot Jupiters are still a fairly poorly understood class of planet, but luckily Tylos and others like it are improving our understanding of them and their potentially dramatic histories. Thank you for watching. If you enjoyed, check out my other videos about exoplanets and space exploration.